Thanks for downloading Live. this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, you can find and the full welcome schedule to Friday and Twilight back to Show. All our shows I'm Claire Cannon. Thank you for joining or. me, whether you are here Enjoy live the or listening to the podcast. We've been back at school a few weeks now and can already see some emerging trends. Um, my background is in SEND, so today I'm looking at what patterns we are likely to see in SEND this year and how we can prepare for what's to come. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Thank you again for joining me here on Teachers Talk Radio. Um, As I said in the introduction, I'm Claire um, and I'm looking forward to being back with you today Um, after what seems like quite a long time away actually because of summer holidays when I was away and then unfortunately I wasn't very well so I missed a show um, when I should have come back a few weeks ago. But I'm here now um, and thank you for joining me especially on a Friday evening if you are listening live. it's always a busy week. I say, you know, thank you for being here after a busy week, but they're always a busy week in schools. So if you are listening live, as I say, thank you very much. And if you are listening on the podcast as a download, thank you as well. It is appreciated and nice to be back, as I say, on here on Teachers Talk Radio. So please do text in at any point in the show um, if you've got any thoughts on some of the things that I'm sharing. Looking today at trends in special educational needs SEND or SEND um why SEND and not anything else well predominantly because I had to pick something um and my background is in SEND um if you've listened to my shows in the past you'll know that um I have been a SENCO um more than once and I've also been assistant head in an alternative provision um very much have always had the thought around the fact that people are um, not just pieces of data or numbers on a spreadsheet. There's much more of a, a holistic picture. And to me, that's that's really important. And as, you know, lots of things have happened in schools, changes over the years, and some of the trends we are seeing, particularly around behaviours that, that challenge, I think that idea of having a holistic view of what's going on for a young person um, is ever, ever more important. Anyway, um, enough about me. Back to trends in SEND. So before actually we take a look at what we might be seeing over the coming academic year, I am going to take a few moments to reflect on the issues that we saw last year. I think it's really important that we have some context, that we know not just where we might be going, but where we've come from, um, what is it that we've we've seen happen already? Where are we now? And therefore, what are we likely to be seeing as we move through the current school year? I can see we have a few people listening live, which is fantastic. Um, if you would like to comment at any point, it'd be lovely if you did text in. So, First of all, let's just have a think about some of the key things that were happening in SEND last year. And this this is not, to be fair, this is not just last year. This is things that have been happening over the last few years. But I have looked, when I'm looking at data and a couple of things like that, you know, it is predominantly what happened in the year just gone. So um, some of these things you will recognise as issues that are wider than just SEND, but they're quite often magnified or more pronounced for students who do have special educational needs. Um, A massive one, a massive one being suspensions. Um, Again, you know, a rising trend, as I say, not just in SEND, it is, you know, suspensions are rising across the school population. But if you have SEND, you are between three and four times more likely to be suspended um, than a student who does not have special educational needs. Now, that is 
um, taking students with an EHCP and those at SEND support. So that is all students um, who have some kind of special education needs. I'm conscious that some people use different um, terminology. So it might be that we're talking about wave one or wave two. Um, if you use that phrasing for your students with special educational needs and disabilities. Um, I can see we've had a question. What is SEND? I think I might have just answered that. SEND stands for Special Educational Needs and Disabilities. Um, so it can cover all sorts of different things. Um, common things would be autism, ADHD, um, dyslexia, but it can there's there's all sorts of different um, things that can be covered under that umbrella term. That's no problem. Thank you for asking that question. So suspensions three to four times more likely to happen um, if you have SEND than if you do not. Um, and then we look at exclusions, um, permanent exclusions. Now, I did actually break this down because if you have an EHCP, an education, health and care plan, so somebody with the highest level of um, need in a school, you are three times, three times more likely than someone without SEN to be permanently excluded. Now, what was a bit of a shock, actually, when I was reading this um, and researching this show was that if you have, if you're at SEND support, so your school has recognised you have a need, but you aren't, um, you aren't someone who has that sort of top end need in the EHCP, you're five times more likely to get permanently excluded. Now, in a way, you'd expect that to be the other way around. You'd think that the students with the highest level of need might be doing things that are more likely to get them excluded. I hope what that means is that the ones with the EHCPs are getting at least a little bit more support um, towards meeting their needs and supporting them um, than those who don't have that document and that funding in place. Um, which kind of made me think, actually, where are we at with EHCPs at the moment? So they are rising. They've been rising for quite a while. Um, and last year, they were up 11.4% on the year before. Now, I was actually um, just today reading some more information about SEND and trends. Uh, I think it was on Schools Week. And it said something like 159% increase in students with the HCPs from when they were first introduced, which I think was back in about 2016. So a huge, huge demand within not just the school system, but the local authority funding system and everything else that goes along with um, having SEN at that level. But, you know, 11.4% up on the year before. And you can break that down even further. You can look at EHCPs in specific categories. And it's students with autism and SEMH that are the biggest percentage increase within that overall trend of EHCPs rising, which probably isn't a surprise to most people. Um, if you work in schools, you know, particularly those behaviours that we find difficult to deal with that challenge us as professionals um, are the things that we're seeing a huge amount of um, year on year. So going back to this rise in EHCPs, the other thing that has then happened is that that's resulted in more SEN tribunals. And that is, there's there's several reasons, I think, for that. So we're starting the year with a backlog in the system already um, because, I mentioned already, actually, local authorities and funding is, is an issue. It should never be a reason why a school puts off applying for a child to have a needs assessment around an EHCP, but... What's happening is that more and more of those needs assessment requests are being declined. What then happens is parents and schools exercise their right of appeal. And that's created this backlog in the tribunal system. So we're starting the year um, with a caseload hanging over from the year before. So what that is doing is creating a delay in pupils getting the support that they need, getting the assessments that's going to give that in-depth picture, um, whether that's of their cognition and learning, whether it is their um, social emotional skills, 
but whatever whatever their need you know that the assessment process that will then guide the provision for them is taking longer and longer and i wonder actually if that is going back to the the amount of exclusions at send support is possibly why it's higher than those with an ehcp because as actually some of those students might be in the system waiting for tribunals and appeals to happen but in the meantime something goes wrong for them so it's all tied in you know there's there's lots of things here that are all tied in together um and i'm sure you know a conversation about unmet need is something that lots of people will have had with colleagues in their schools um but what what happens then what happens with these students who are getting excluded from school we are talking about trends but first of all setting the scene for the start of this year so that we've got some context for where things are likely to head um, now I as I mentioned work in alternative provision and one of the things that was I say surprising it was surprising and it wasn't at the same time but um, the provision I work in actually the places we have available were pretty much used up by Christmas um in the last academic year that's never happened before those places are supposed to be able to cater for you know exclusions as they come through for the whole academic year but we were pretty much full by christmas and i think that is you know indicative of the rise in the number of students getting um those more severe consequences but i think it's also again a reflection of unmet need because for a lot of those students they they come in and they've experienced a lot of trauma um, whether that's at home or in school or both and that could be issues around lack of access to services it could be socioeconomic difficulties for some of them it's substance abuse either their own or a family member and lots of other things that can be going on for them as well but again, um, struggling to access the support they need at a time when the support can make a real difference before things get too late. And I think that is something, unfortunately, we are going to see more of um, as we go through the year. Um, what else? Uh, I've actually started to look at the statistics with alternative provision and when students are arriving. So if you look at secondary, in year seven across the country, we are on around a thousand pupils in alternative provision that are year seven by age. In year eight, that goes up to just over 3,000. By year 11, that's over 9,000 students. So then I thought, what was going on in primary? Well, there's in the low hundreds for the whole of you know primary per year group. So there's definitely something happening as they move into secondary school. Um, and it seems particularly that shift from sort of year seven, eight, when they're key stage three, and then into year nine, 10 and 11, when they start looking at, at GCSEs. I know some schools don't do GCSEs in year nine, but there are some that do. So an interesting picture, more, more and more students, the higher up you go, requiring some kind of alternative provision. Um, if you have any thoughts on why that might be or what you're seeing in your school, be interested to hear from you. So please, you know, do text in. Um, and finally, just while we're talking about GCSEs, actually, they, again, those with SEND are sadly doing less well at GCSE um, than their peers. Now, that has long been the case, but unfortunately, the gap is widening. Um, there was in, an increase in the gap this year of 2% um, between students with SEND and students without. So those with are doing less well um, than those who do not have SEND. Um, I think it's important to say at this point that SEND does not automatically equal lower attainment. Um, it can, you know, it is, it's independent a lot of the time on, if you like, intellectual ability, but the impact of the special need can have a wider implication for that young person which then does affect what they end up achieving um, in those qualifications 
Anyway, I've, I'm conscious I seem to have painted quite a bleak picture there. And yes, you know, there certainly are some issues that are not going to have quick fixes, but there are really some, you know, some quite significant things coming up this year and moving forward that are very much things we can be optimistic about. So after the break, um, we'll move forward and think about what it is that's likely to happen in the year ahead. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Introducing Reading Solutions UK home to Dreambox Reading Plus, the online reading development program improving outcomes for students and schools nationwide. Create stronger readers in your school from Key Stage 2 to beyond GCSE using Reading Plus's evidence-based adaptive technology. Reading Plus accurately assesses your students' skills gaps and places them on a personalized learning pathway built to accelerate their strengths and improve on their areas for development. You can try the programme with a free four-week pilot today. Search Reading Solutions UK to find their website and request your free pilot today. How can you show your students the opportunities that await them? How can you fuel their aspirations and motivate them to achieve? Future and Careers provides a wealth of stimulating resources aimed at encouraging 14 to 19 year olds to pursue careers in STEM and SHAPE. We help you to show your students what they can aim for and how. From articles to activity sheets, animations to podcasts, all our resources align with Gatsby benchmarks and are free for you and your students to download. Visit futureandcareers.com and subscribe today. Future and Careers helping teachers to inspire the next generation. Get set for the year ahead with the Bloomsbury Education Back to School Sale. Save 30% on all Bloomsbury Education books until 30th September. From the very best in research-led practice to trusted advice on inclusivity, behaviour and curriculum design, we've got something for everyone. Visit bloomsbury.com forward slash B2S sale to shop now and save 30%. Bloomsbury Education, books for every step of your teaching journey. Teachers, mark your calendars for BET UK 2025, the world's biggest edtech event. Join over 30,000 educators at the Excel London from the 22nd to the 24th of January. Discover the latest edtech innovations, network with peers and access hundreds of hours of CPD. Did we mention it's 100% free for educators? Whether you're looking for inspiration or practical tools to enhance your teaching, BET has it all. Don't miss this opportunity to shape the future of education. Register today at uk.betshow.com. That's uk.betshow.com. Before the break, I covered a few things that were very noticeable last year um, as a way of putting some context really around some of the trends we are likely to see as the year um, moves on. So firstly, building on some trends around SEMH um, issues, so social, emotional and mental health needs. Um, One of the biggest areas that has increased in terms of students having an EHCP um, and a kind of, you know, linked to that, although I didn't mention it actually in my introduction, but linked to that are the issues around attendance. Um, And I think this will be something to, to monitor and work on. And I'm quite interested to see what will happen in terms of, you know, the picture around attendance. Because um, for those of you who are responsible for sort of tracking these kind of things, will know that there's been some changes to the attendance codes um, as of September 24. So some of the data um, will be able to be drilled down a little bit more than perhaps it was before, um, and some data is not going to be in the same format necessarily or in the same category or same bucket so comparing like for like um that's not to say it's impossible but it it might not be the same as it's looked previously um 
But, you know, for whatever reason it is that a student has got an issue around coming to school, um, their social, emotional, mental health needs are never going to be things that have a quick fix. So I think those pupils, you know, if we're looking at the year ahead, those pupils who were classed as EBSA, Emotionally Based School Avoidant, last year, are they're not necessarily going to have magically fixed, if you like, over the summer holidays. So those students are still going to be in our system. Their attendance, or lack of, sadly, is still going to um, be very real in terms of our data and our statistics and, and the picture of what is going on for that young person. Adding in um, any new students that come into your setting, whether you're primary or secondary. Um, and, you know, we we know that these students need a lot of support to be able to come back into a school setting that might be at all or it might be to increase their attendance if they are perhaps on some kind of part-time provision but what we need for that to happen is greater access to things like mental health teams greater access to those assessments um, that are going to give us that better understanding of their need so we're still in the midst of all of that being being sorted out and as I say we started the year with a backlog in terms of access to assessments and things. So I think for some of these young people, um, their the support they need around their attendance is perhaps going to be a little while coming. Um, and there are some fantastic things happening within schools um, that are designed to support them. But you know, for some for some of our young people, they definitely need more. So I think that is a trend that is with us for a little while. Um, is this issue around some of the students and their persistent absence, their emotionally based school avoidance and needing more support than schools can perhaps put in place um, in order to get them back. Now, if we're talking about students who are not in school, you know, that can include the students who have had exclusions and suspensions. So one of the things here will be around, you know, how do we support those students who are struggling to whether that's regulate their emotions whether it's you know do the things that we're expecting of them at the times we expect of them um and i i suppose this this got me thinking about my own experiences at school and and i have a question for any of you listening actually on that you know how many of you have a favorite teacher or have a member of staff that you still remember now the question is, why were they your favourite? What was it about them um, that made them that person that you still think about, that you still remember? And if someone says to you, think back, um, think back to school, who is it that really stands out for you? Why is it that particular person? Now, I remember mine. Um, she actually was an RE teacher, um, sometimes taught English, although I was not in her English class. She was also my head of year. Um, now, I have to say, I was not exactly a model pupil, and English and RE were certainly not my strong points or subjects I was particularly interested in. Um, and unfortunately, me and my, my English teacher did not get on, and I was certainly not um, the most compliant in her lessons. Um, however, if my head of year sat me down and said, come on, let's get your English coursework, your GCSE sorted out, um, I'd get on and do it. Um, not necessarily overly happy about it, but I would get on and do it, which was a bit of a change from if the actual English teacher asked me. So how come, when I much preferred maths and science, how come that head of year was able to get me to do things that I really didn't want to do? And it goes back to the fact that she built a relationship with me. Um, and I think that's really powerful because not only did she help me get my coursework done, so I do actually have a GCSE in English, because I think that was questionable at one point, but it also means that you're not allowing unwanted behaviours to go unchallenged. I think sometimes that gets a little bit confused as a message around relational approaches and, and building up you know, trust with a young person and a specific member of staff. It's absolutely not about allowing a student's behaviour to go without a consequence. 
what it does do is actually it means that that person who's got a relationship can absolutely hold that student to account and they should hold that student to account and that person will have more impact when they hold the student to account than you know another member of staff telling them they've got a a C3 or whatever your consequence system is and that means X sanction is going to happen which is kind of run by somebody else who's disconnected from the whole situation you have someone who means something to that young person and whose you know relationship that young person really really wants really needs and really values they're not going to want to upset that person and they will know when they have and therefore the reaction and the response from that trusted person will have far more impact and far more you know long lasting effect than a as i say a disconnected consequence that happens on a a different day at a different time with a different person so for me you know yeah i digress slightly but i think when we when we're looking at trends in special educational needs i think giving repeated suspensions and exclusions isn't actually resulting in a change in behavior it's not impacting those students in terms of how they respond or react to a situation so you know if they're going on to do more of the same because of that consequence we need to think about doing something differently why are we keeping on doing the same thing when there are other options out there i don't know if it's because it's easier i know a lot of the time the conversation will go back to availability of resources or lack of, whether that's time, whether it's staff, whether it's space in a school. And I, I do completely understand that. But I think, you know, we're human beings. And if we can start to shift this trend away from sort of default consequences, I'm not saying consequences shouldn't happen. They absolutely should. I work in an alternative provision. Things happen every day um, that result in a consequence for a young person. They are held accountable, but it's how you hold them accountable that is the thing that has an impact. And for me, that's that's something I'm seeing more of a conversation about. And I hope that as we move through the year, that conversation carries on. It opens up. More people get involved and actually then reflect on whether that's their own individual practice or what is going on in their school, if they are a leader. And they start to then think about what changes they might want to put in place. Okay. Um, Carrying on with behaviour as a little bit of a thread. Um, Autism, as I mentioned before, is by far um, the biggest need in an EHCP. um, Followed by SEMH. And then actually speech and language communication needs is not far behind in third place. Now that is, that's from the FFT data. That's quite recent. Um, if we again thinking about trends, you know, these pupils, they're not all in year 11. They're in various year groups. So the fact that there's a high number now means that there is going to be a continuing high number as we go through this year, next year and so on, because they're still in our system and more students are going to get added um, either as they start school in EYFS in year one or as they get identified um, once they've been in school for a little while and people start to notice um, some things about them. So I do think that that is something that isn't going to go away. Uh, We are going to see a continuing high level of need linked to autism and SEMH and also speech and language. But I think something that does need need looking at and I hope again this is a conversation that starts to open up this year is around the fact that some people are struggling with the the idea of students having more than one diagnosis hi Tom I've just seen you uh, pop up on my screen there nice to see you this evening um but yeah people sort of saying well if a student's already got one diagnosis for example ADHD then well maybe it's not trauma as well Maybe it's just the ADHD and, you know, they're being particularly impulsive or particularly hyperactive at the moment. But actually, those two diagnoses are completely independent of one another. You can have both of those things in the same way as you can have autism 
as well as ADHD or autism and dyslexia or ADHD and dyslexia. You know, they're, they're all comorbid. They can all happen um, at the same time. Now, clearly, that can be very, very difficult to untangle and to unpick um, what behavior or what presentation is linked to what need. And also, remembering the fact that these are young people, they make choices and sometimes they will make a choice that's inappropriate. Um, and unpicking that from their need as well is an even greater challenge. But again, these these trends around diagnosis and greater awareness, it's good that we have them, but it does mean that we're going to see more of these pupils coming through, I think, having a dual diagnosis or potentially even more um, than two. So thinking about trends moving forward, definitely something that we are going to need to think about as, as teachers is what do we do for those students who are um, coming to us with more complex needs? Probably links back to that rise in EHCPs that I was mentioning earlier on. So if we're thinking about those needs, a lot of the time, particularly around autism, we will look at the student and say, oh, you know, they show black and white thinking. They can be quite rigid. They can be quite inflexible. And those things, you know, they're absolutely true. They vary, obviously, by individuals because just, you know, one student who has autism will present very differently to another who has the same diagnosis. But that thinking around, you know, oh, they're very, they're very rigid, they're very inflexible, doesn't mean that they can't be taught with some explicit instruction that actually sometimes things do have grey areas. Um, and I think, you know, again, going back to this idea of suspensions and exclusions, you know, we need to make sure that, yes, we are putting in place boundaries, holding students to account and having consequences for those serious types of behaviour. However, understanding it from the point of view of the need that the student has. You know, somebody who is very impulsive, who's very reactive because for example they have ADHD and a friend jokingly says to them oh, go and punch that person and I'll say this because I've seen it and the student just went up to them and punched them not hard um it doesn't really matter they shouldn't be punching them anyway and afterwards kind of had that moment of reflection and go oh my goodness what have I done um very very apologetic about it very you know showed remorse but if we have a rigid consequence system where we say, no, that's it, you have physically harmed another student and you had no motive for doing so, you get a suspension. You're not actually teaching the child anything other than to be ashamed of their own behaviour. If they're already showing that they understand what they did was wrong and that they have a level of need, that means it's very hard for them you know, to control what's going on in that pressurised, you know, peer pressure situation. You know, we have to we have to be starting to look at the more, you know, the holistic needs and the holistic picture around a young person. So for me, trends moving forward, you know, those all those conversations around why behaviors are happening, understanding what it is that's going on. It's not a binary thing. You don't do that instead of a consequence. You do both. For me, you absolutely do both. But it's about making sure that the consequence that happens for the young person kind of matches or is proportionate to what has happened and takes into account their need. And again, I say that, you know, working in alternative provision, things happen on a regular basis that, you know, we do need to make sure students have a consequence for, for what's, what they've done or what's happened or what they've not done, could be the other way around. Um, but also bearing in mind the bigger picture around what has gone on. OK, um, moving away a little bit from some of the statistics and more challenging trends in SEND, because actually there's a whole lot to look forward to and to be optimistic about. One of the big things for me is that there is now this new NPQ. Um, so thinking about SEND, you know, the NPQ SENCO, for me, that's a massive change and, and really, really needed because the NACENCO um, was very much research based. Now, absolutely, that has its place, and it's it's vital that senkos 
are aware of the research around different conditions, different types of provision and strategies. Um, however, what was quite often fed back was that there wasn't as much emphasis on the here and now and the SEN landscape that they were going to go into when they started their SENCO role, or if they were in role, um, what they could expect and what to do with some of the situations that were coming their way. So I think it's it's really good to see that the new MPQ is much more around case studies. It's going to give a lot more opportunities for people to discuss what is happening, what they're seeing, and to have those conversations actually with other professionals. And I think that's that's a really supportive thing. We all know, don't we? Sometimes you do just need to offload, but other times you just get a bit stuck with something and you think, I could do with asking somebody else what they might suggest or, you know, does this sound okay? Can you just sense that check this for me? So that's really, really positive for me that those opportunities are going to be built in to the new qualification. Networking, again, linked in with the discussion, real life scenarios going back to the case studies, that's going to make a massive difference. Yes, the research is important, but actually, how do you put that into practice? How do you apply it? How do you make it work in your setting? That's going to be absolutely crucial. And hopefully it will give those new to the Senko role a lot more confidence in what they're doing and that they're making the right decisions for the students that they are um, looking after. Another thing that I think is really positive for new SENCOs is that the qualification is going to cover much more of the SEN law. That definitely was missing from um, the previous qualification, I know, um, because I did it and then found out that there was a whole lot of stuff that I didn't know when I needed to start looking at needs assessments and EHCP reviews and challenging local authority decisions. So I think the fact that that's now going to be built in to the qualification, again, will make a huge difference and hopefully will mean that things happen more quickly because the people who are best placed to support not just the child but their family actually, I don't mean this to sound funny, but kind of know what they're talking about, but know from the off. They're not finding it out two or three years into their role when something crops up and they have to go digging about for some case law or something. They're actually going to know from the beginning. So really, really positive, as I say, a, a big shift in the SEN training that SENCOs are going to receive. So a massive, um, massive positive, one that I'm really happy to see, as um, as you can probably tell. So um, I also, you know, mentioning these relational approaches, I think that's also going to come partly from the case studies that are going to be built in to the new MPQ SENCO, but also part of conversations that I'm seeing already happening on various forms of social media, people talking about um, also what, not just the fact that these approaches need to happen, but thinking about how and where. For me, that is, again, really, really important because having a conversation is one thing, but have you had the conversation in a way that maximizes that time you have together with the other person. If it's rushed, you know what it's like? Someone catches you in the corridor and they ask you something, or can you remember to do this? Or have you seen this? By the time you get to your next classroom, you've forgotten what it was, or it's so far down your to-do list, it kind of gets parked for ages. Are you having these conversations in an appropriate space? Is it a quiet room? Is it an office? Is it that the child actually needs to just walk and talk with you outside somewhere you know are you are you actually having a conversation in the manner which is going to help solve the problem or are you adding to the problem by doing it in a time and place that isn't actually appropriate so thinking about those trends moving forward I think it's really lovely that people are starting to look at not just having the conversations but how you can make those conversations have the most possible impacts that they can. Um, one more positive thing from me in terms of looking forward to being optimistic about SEN before um, we have a break for the news is looking at the environment as a whole. Now this is really interesting, it's something I've got um, quite a passion about at the moment, is 
particularly primary schools, but the kind of sensory input that you get just from being in that that location, that building, that room. And I think there are some absolutely amazing displays. Um, I say it is often primary schools, not excluding secondary schools, but it is often in primaries where I see this, that there's there's really bright, colourful displays. People have gone to a lot of effort, a lot of time has gone in to creating some really interesting things on the wall, sometimes the ceiling, sometimes going around corners. Um, but actually, my question is, does it need to be there? Does it need to be there in that extent or amount? Because I think sometimes we run the risk almost of detracting from the things that really matter. Um, and I think of one particular classroom I was in where I struggled initially when I walked in. I was like, oh, where's the board? It was there. It was actually at the front of the room where you'd kind of expect it to be. But it was so covered um, or surrounded rather than covered. The board was surrounded by so many other things, posters, times tables, students' work. Again, lovely that it was all being shared. But I thought for the students who are neurodiverse in some way, neurodivergent, how much are they actually picking up of what's on the board and what they're supposed to be paying attention to? How much are they being distracted by the other stimuli all around them? So, again, really, for me, a real positive that I'm seeing conversations about how to have effective displays, have information on the wall, celebrate pupils' successes and, you know, the lovely work that they produce without causing a sensory overload, which I think has the, a secondary impact there of helping people with their workload, which to me is only a good thing because as much as, you know, those displays do look fantastic, they would have taken so much time and I think if we can get a balance that works for the students and also works for the staff, that is something that is is going to be is win win, isn't it? And I think that's that's something that will be working in everybody's favour. So, as I say, yes, there were lots of things earlier on that are challenges and are going to continue to be challenges um, with SEN this year, but also a lot to look forward to and feel positive about for the year ahead. So I'm um, going to take a little break for the news now and then I'm going to pick up on a couple more things when we come back. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Introducing Reading Solutions UK. Home to Dreambox Reading Plus, the online reading development programme improving outcomes for students and schools nationwide. Create stronger readers in your school from Key Stage 2 to beyond GCSE using Reading Plus's evidence-based adaptive technology. Reading Plus accurately assesses your students' skills gaps and places them on a personalised learning pathway, built to accelerate their strengths and improve on their areas for development. You can try the programme with a free four-week pilot today. Search Reading Solutions UK to find their website and request your free pilot today. How can you show your students the opportunities that await them? How can you fuel their aspirations and motivate them to achieve? Futurum Careers provides a wealth of stimulating resources aimed at encouraging 14 to 19 year olds to pursue careers in STEM and SHAPE. We help you to show your students what they can aim for and how. From articles to activity sheets, animations to podcasts, all our resources align with Gatsby benchmarks and are free for you and your students to download. Visit futurumcareers.com and subscribe today. Futurum Careers helping teachers to inspire the next generation. Get set for the year ahead with the Bloomsbury Education Back to School Sale. Save 30% on all Bloomsbury Education books until 30th September. 
From the very best in research-led practice to trusted advice on inclusivity, behavior, and curriculum design, we've got something for everyone. Visit bloomsbury.com forward slash B2S sale to shop now and save 30%. Bloomsbury Education, books for every step of your teaching journey. Teachers, mark your calendars for BetUK 2025, the world's biggest edtech event. Join over 30,000 educators at the Excel London from the 22nd to the 24th of January. Discover the latest edtech innovations, network with peers and access hundreds of hours of CPD. Did we mention it's 100% free for educators? Whether you're looking for inspiration or practical tools to enhance your teaching, BET has it all. Don't miss this opportunity to shape the future of education. Register today at uk.betshow.com. That's uk.betshow.com. This is Teachers Talk Radio. And this is Teachers Talk Radio News. Two linked stories feature on the BBC News website. The first is an in-depth piece on tuition fees and government funding for higher education, with 141 UK universities now calling for change. Whilst many universities have previously made comments on the funding crisis, the BBC Today programme says Universities UK is now saying that a rise in tuition fees and more government investment is needed so that the sector does not slide into decline. This comes as record numbers of home students begin courses this month, but the number of international students is down. About 40% of universities are expecting to return a budget deficit this year, according to the regulator, the Office for Students. Universities UK says that if investment in teaching students had kept up with inflation funding per student, it would be in the region of 12 to 13,000 pounds. Higher Education Policy Institute says it would be politically difficult to put up fees, but there needs to be a decision about funding. Changes to visa rules and a currency crash in Nigeria have reduced applications for students from abroad. Whilst the cost of living crisis means students now need about £18,000 a year to live on, but the maximum loan amount is £10,000. The full Today programme is available on BBC Sounds. Meanwhile, another story is the amount of debt graduates are leaving university with. The BBC focuses on those graduates who took out loans in England and Wales between 2012 and 2023, when interest rates hit 8%. The article tells the story of graduate Adam who borrowed £44,000 and has paid back £7,000 since graduating four years ago, but now owes £54,000. Despite having a good job, his salary isn't even covering the interest on the debt and the amount is going up, not down. This situation predominantly affects those on Plan 2 loans. With some graduates reporting that the repayments are making applying for mortgages difficult and others viewing it as a tax on graduates, the Save the Student campaign group says it could, but shouldn't, put students off. Whichever way we look at it, it seems the issues of funding, tuition fees and student loans are something the government will need to tackle. Although a Department for Education spokesperson acknowledged, it's going to take time to get it right. In the world of online technology, something many young people use regularly, Instagram has said it is overhauling the way it works for teenagers. In a press release, it promised more built-in protections for young people and said it had added controls for parents. The new teen accounts have been introduced in the UK, as well as the US, Canada and Australia. This means privacy settings will be activated by default for all under 18s, including making content unviewable for people who don't follow them and actively require approval for all new followers. Children aged 13 to 15 will only be able to adjust these settings by adding a parent or guardian to their account. The UK children's charity, the NSPCC, responded to Instagram's announcement by calling it a step in the right direction, but said it must also be backed up by proactive measures that prevent harmful content in the first place. Further details of this story can be found online. The Guardian reports on school uniforms in France. 
Uniforms have not been compulsory in state schools in France since 1968. They have made a return in one town to establish if they can reduce inequality and improve behaviour. The school uniform debate has long been a focus of discussion in the UK and has sometimes been seen as something of a polarising topic. In France, 700 pupils at four schools in Béziers are taking part in the scheme that the government says could be rolled out nationwide, if it is successful. A French government minister said, we would like to see if wearing a uniform can create tranquility in classrooms, because we know you learn better in a peaceful environment. The mayor of Béziers said uniforms would help combat bullying, but a teachers union said it was a superficial response to a fundamental problem and would in no way help resolve troubles. Some parents have objected to the uniform, saying that public schools should not ape the worst excesses of private schools. This was written in an open letter of protest. Uniforms were first introduced in France in 1802 by Napoleon, but have not been compulsory since 1968. Whatever the outcome of the pilot, it seems clear that the topic of uniform is a hot one. Finally, BBC Leicester covers the story of Billy, the emotional support tortoise, who can be found working in a Leicestershire school. Billy, aged 11, wanders the corridors and has a heart-shaped balloon attached to his shell so students can see him coming. He is described as a calming presence who works in the school's learning support department, helping students who are feeling overwhelmed. Billy has his own lanyard carrying his photo and his official title. He works hard to support pupils by being lovely, fun and cute. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Jo Fox. Hey, thank you there to um, Jo for the news and to our sponsors for their support of Teachers Talk Radio. Um, I have to say, when we're talking about trends in special needs, a emotional support tortoise was not one of the things that I had in mind. But there we go. I think that's great. Um, I've long been an advocate for animals in schools, school dogs, um, was actually my first ever show here on Teachers Talk Radio. That was a while ago. Um, but there we go. So animals in schools, I think that's a trend that can definitely carry on. Um, now, I did have one other thing to pick up on. Now, was that thinking earlier on about the challenges in SEN and then some of the things to be um, optimistic about? I think this one is... Um, you could call it an opportunity, but I definitely think it's something that's going to become more and more um, prevalent, um, not just for those with SEN, actually, but also um, to support the, the wider student body and um, also staff. And, and that is AI, because there are some incredible tools out there. Um, I think it's great as well that many of them are are completely free for users, especially if you have an education account. Um, so. You know, given that it can support everyone, staff and students, why do I think it has particular relevance for people with special educational needs? So just to share an example, um, there was a student who, um, I say student, a friend of mine whose who's child um, had a task to do over the summer. Now, this young person does have their own needs. Um, and what someone had done was taken the initial task instructions and tried to break the task down. Well, they had broken the task down into different chunks, into different sections. But actually what happened is that made the task look longer and the student became, the child became overwhelmed because it looked like they had more to do than the original instruction. So, you know, there's some I say fantastic tools out there with AI that will actually reword rather than chunk out your instructions. So the student is getting the same kind of visual input, if you like, when they look at the task, but actually it's been paraphrased. Now I know, you know, as as staff, as as adults, as educators, we're perfectly capable of doing things like that ourselves. But for me, this is about something that will save time um, as much as anything. I think another really clever thing are tools that will let you create questions based on a video. So you can put a video link in and it will, I don't know how it does it, I guess, sort of read, if you like, listen to, read the the content, um, and it will actually 
co you know comprehension questions, multiple choice questions, um, which you know as I've mentioned a few times. I work in alternative provision. And sometimes the way that we will find that we have to sort of support a student best is things that link to their interests. So that could be quite a time consuming process if you were doing that for several students. My classes only have sort of up to six students in, but even for six students, you know, you watch a couple of minute videos for each one and that's half an hour. So the power of that, where you can have, find a video, it could even be a revision activity. You know, it could be the same video that everybody has, but you create a set of questions. Then you do things like you change the questions depending on the reading ability of the young person or you know, are they working at foundation GCSE or higher GCSE and you could use use the tools to kind of go wherever you want with with that and particularly say for students with special educational needs the fact that you can really tailor it to them literally at the quick of, click of a button I think that that is incredible um I really like some of the uh tools that will turn what can be a seemingly not a relevant task but one that students find hard to understand why they have to learn that particular thing percentages fractions decimals quite often things as a math teacher I will get asked why do we have to do that and you can talk about interest and depreciation on your car but for some students that's that's too far in the future they they just don't think that far ahead and perhaps they they struggle to do that if they've got an additional need so stick it into an AI that will actually then Go, okay, what's your learning objective and what's the student interested in? And I will create a worksheet that's, you know, fractions about, I don't know, um, being a farmer or something if they want to work with, with animals and be outside or being a roofer or being a car mechanic, anything. I just think that is, you know, an incredible way of using something that a student is more likely to engage with, again, without causing a massive workload for for staff who you know we've let's face it we've all got a lot that we're we're all trying to do um while we're thinking about staff workload actually you know, there are some very clever bits that i've found so there was a, a question on social media people were debating i think it was one of the year six texts and you know does it mean this does it mean that how would you approach you know this particular section with your class now i didn't I'd never read the book. I didn't know the story. I didn't have the book. So I actually put into AI, you know, asked it to summarize and put the name of the book in 100 words, 200 words, whatever it was. And it gave it back within a few seconds. And, you know, that, that's, not to, that's not to necessarily recommend that as an approach to teaching the, the text to a class. But for me, as somebody wanting to understand the debate and the questions, and some of the answers that were coming through, that was um, really, really helpful, something I found very, very useful. Um, I mentioned earlier on that SEN doesn't automatically mean a student is um, lower attainer. You know, they, they don't have to be at the bottom end of you know, the attainment scale just because they have um, a special need. So one of the things you can do with AI is, is go the other way, and you could make something harder or adjust the reading age to be higher if you need to challenge your more able learners and actually you know again that's something that is not just for SEN that could be for any of your students um, I think you know that that's something again that quite often people people do struggle with is finding the time to get all these resources prepared and and now we have these tools that can make a massive difference um, so that they could perhaps be more routinely used than sometimes they are um, and I know that's not because people don't want to it's just it is that thing of having enough time um, now thinking specifically about um, SENCOs now not just the students but there are there are tools that will help create IEPs um, individual education plans some people call them something different but the concept being a document that will set targets um, think about the provision that a student might need to be able to meet those targets and also the things that you might might need to notice and track to know whether or not the provision was having the impact um, that you want it to have. 
So those kind of, again, you know, there's having been a Senko, there is a lot of paperwork. There are a lot of things that you need to keep an eye on and see, you know, are they working sometimes to a specific time scale or because it needs to go back to a certain person. So if you've got a tool that can actually help manage that and streamline those processes, again, I think that is going to be a game changer. If we're talking about SEN and workload for Senkos, that for me really is um, a game changer and a trend that I hope is something people pick up on and use and experiment with. And I think that that's one of the key things here. It's It's not being scared of what this technology can do. And quite often when we are faced with something new and something that's a big change, you know, it's a human thing to default to going, oh, no, not sure about that. I'm, I'm gonna, not going not gonna to go there. I'm not going to interact with it. I'm going to leave it for either forever or for a bit and see what happens. But actually, my, my thoughts are try it out. What's the worst that could happen if you give it a go? You might find you don't like it fair enough, but at least you've tried. You know, there's nothing really can go wrong. If you're talking about a text, my example from a few minutes ago, putting in, you know, use a book that you know. If you want to see how accurate it can be, use something you know. Ask it to summarise whatever you've just been reading and see what comes back. Um, have a play with it. Um, and another another thing for me is actually then not just learning as, as adults, as professionals and teachers, what we do with AI, but actually supporting our students. Because if we leave them, if we leave this for too long, you know, they're already experimenting. They're already finding out what they can do with it. But actually, we want them to know how to use it in a productive way. So can you, for example, a student who has dyslexia, can you find a tool that will help them with proofreading their work? And that's different to just putting on um, the text-to-speech facility that a lot of computers have. It's actually doing more. It's talking through the grammar. It's, it's giving them suggestions. It's helping them look through at um, a greater depth. Um, and I mean that not in the SAT way or anything else, but you know, rather than as a superficial level or a surface level. Um, if we're thinking about students with dyslexia and ADHD, they struggle sometimes with organisation, with meeting deadlines. Um, and that can actually lead, and I've seen this, can lead to quite a lot of, of shame um, and resentment towards their diagnosis and the way their brain works when actually they're perfectly capable human beings. They just need a little bit of help and support. And let's face it, don't we all at, at various times? But again, there are tools that can can help them, that can provide prompts, that can colour code things for them because you tell it once, you know, this is what red means, this is what green means, this is what blue means, and it will be able to automatically assign and label things for them and just, just help keep on top of, you know, whether it is coursework, homework deadlines and so on. Um, and finally, there are, you know, some of the ones now that are getting even more realistic are actually be able to create a simulation. So if you have students with autism, if you have students with behaviours that challenge our norms, um, sometimes we will use social stories with them and people quite often write them. And that's absolutely fine. Sometimes people will purchase them from places. There are AI apps that will write a social story for you given a few prompts but there are also now some starting to be able to create videos and you know our students live in a very digital <laughs> digitized world they watch videos all the time so to be able to use a, a medium that they are comfortable and familiar with for me that's reducing a barrier because they will just naturally you know they know how to operate a video they can you know, fast forward, reverse, watch bits back, whatever it is they want to do. You're just giving them something that enables them to learn in a way that makes kind of the most use of what they're familiar with, um, as well as hopefully saving you some time because you've been able to generate it using this technology. Um, so lots there to think about. Um, I can see we have quite a few people listening live this evening, which is 
lovely. So if you do have any thoughts, whether it's on AI and supporting SEN using AI tools uh, or any of the things I talked about earlier in the show, um, do text in. It'd be lovely to hear from you before we get towards the end. We're just going to hear from our sponsors one more time before a few conclusions from me. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Introducing Reading Solutions UK home to Dreambox Reading Plus, the online reading development programme improving outcomes for students and schools nationwide. Create stronger readers in your school from Key Stage 2 to beyond GCSE using Reading Plus's evidence-based adaptive technology. Reading Plus accurately assesses your students' skills gaps and places them on a personalised learning pathway built to accelerate their strengths and improve on their areas for development. You can try the programme with a free four-week pilot today. Search Reading Solutions UK to find their website and request your free pilot today. How can you show your students the opportunities that await them? How can you fuel their aspirations and motivate them to achieve? Futurum Careers provides a wealth of stimulating resources aimed at encouraging 14 to 19 year olds to pursue careers in STEM and SHAPE. We help you to show your students what they can aim for and how. From articles to activity sheets, animations to podcasts, all our resources align with Gatsby benchmarks and are free for you and your students to download. Visit futurumcareers.com and subscribe today. Futurum Careers helping teachers to inspire the next generation. Get set for the year ahead with the Bloomsbury Education Back to School Sale. Save 30% on all Bloomsbury Education books until 30th September. From the very best in research-led practice to trusted advice on inclusivity, behaviour and curriculum design, we've got something for everyone. Visit bloomsbury.com forward slash B2S sale to shop now and save 30%. Bloomsbury Education, books for every step of your teaching journey. Teachers, mark your calendars for BET UK 2025, the world's biggest edtech event. Join over 30,000 educators at the Excel London from the 22nd to the 24th of January. Discover the latest edtech innovations, network with peers and access hundreds of hours of CPD. Did we mention it's 100% free for educators? Whether you're looking for inspiration or practical tools to enhance your teaching, BET has it all. Don't miss this opportunity to shape the future of education. Register today at uk.betshow.com. That's uk.betshow.com. Okay, thank you once again to our sponsors uh, for their support of us here at Teachers Talk Radio. Been talking this evening about the SEN landscape, where we've come from over the last year couple of years where we are at the start of the current academic year and therefore some of the trends we are likely to see as we move through the year ahead. So I just wanted to tie that all together as we come towards the end of the show um, as a little bit of a conclusion. So yes, we are starting from a picture where things like EHCPs are going to continue to rise. There is that backlog in the system where things like tribunals and appeals, you know, they've been sitting there, so they will need to catch up. They will need to work through at the same time as more cases are being added. So there's not a quick fix. You know, there's only so much capacity within the system. So that is something we're going to continue seeing as we go through the school year. Um, and particularly you know, again, and not a rise in students who have social, emotional, mental health difficulties, autism, speech and language and communication needs. That, I think, again, something that we're continuing to see a rise in and is likely to carry on as we move through the year. And because of that, you know, those needs are increasingly difficult for schools to manage. 
particularly the students who have a comorbid or dual diagnosis or sometimes more than more than two what that kind of causes is an increase in the amount of students who are accessing alternative provision so again something that we will continue to see rising um, and a trend for schools to look at alternative provision as a way of supporting their most complex students i'm going to watch closely this year how the new attendance codes um, affect the statistics affect how um, we are sort of monitoring and recording patterns what those patterns start to look like as that data you know fills up if you like as we move through the year and what kind of patterns are being captured now that we have a little bit more granular detail particularly around those students who are attending part-time or as i mentioned going to something like an alternative provision so yes you know there are some challenges that are going to continue to be present in our lives as teachers as leaders in schools but also some really exciting things to look forward to big one for me being that change to the senko qualification and the amount of knowledge that is day-to-day -day rather than the higher level research stuff um, you know, that day-to-day -day knowledge that SENCOs are going to start their role already having or working on within the first year or so of taking on that position, that for me is, is a huge step forward, um, not just for the students, but also for the families and for the staff as well that are um, supporting our young people. I've also looked at how relational approaches are getting much more of a nuanced conversation now. It's not, you know, relational approaches or putting in place consequences. Actually, that discussion is, is you know, meeting in the middle and actually how can we do both? Because we do need to have both. We need to have relationships, but we do also need to make sure students are held to account um, at certain times when, when they need to be. Um, Building on that is then where do those relational conversations happen? What are we doing to make sure those conversations are productive? And then even broader than that, what are we doing with our environment to make sure that is the best for our young people? Is it overstimulated because there's a lot of visual stuff going on? Or actually, are we pairing that back a little bit, which is also then going to help with staff workload if they are not having to produce so many different classroom displays and then i left with a bit of an opportunity or I finished with a bit of an opportunity which is around how ai can be something that we utilize to support our students with special educational needs to teach them different techniques to give them other tools that they can use to be independent learners and also to be independent adults um, as well as that what are we doing as staff? How can we use AI as staff to support our own workload um, and to support the students that we are teaching day to day? So a lot covered in the show. Thank you to those of you who have been listening live. And if you're listening back on the podcast, thank you to you as well. I'm just going to leave you with one final question, which is, will you go and have a look at some AI tools to see what they can do? And if you are reluctant, you know, my, my other question earlier on is, what's the worst that can happen? There's all different types of AIs out there. Some will do more than others. Go and have a little bit of a play and have a look, because hopefully there'll be something that will work for you. Um, and if you do find something, do share it with other people. Share, share what you've found and help them out as well. OK, so lots, as I say, lots covered. Um, it's been really good to be back on Teachers Talk Radio after a bit of a, an absence over the last two months or so. Thank you very much for listening. Do check out the other live shows that are coming up over the next week and, of course, all those that are available to download as podcasts. Have a lovely weekend and I will see you again soon. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.